We cannot live without our lives. We cannot live without our lives. We cannot live without our lives. The seams of our minds and wombs tearing open as we rebirth ancestors as children who may leave us when we are 70, too old for them to parent like we parented them, dying alone in concrete cages, cold, erased, and alone. We women, we women, we cannot live without our lives. We, bludgeoned and betrayed by wombs and knives that explode our houses, our hearts, our streets, caught in the crossfire of property and potential, the trophies of war, silence, ownership, violence. We cannot live without our lives. We women, we cannot live without our lives. We women, we women, stitched lips shut, hands bended backwards, neck noosed, broken, no feeding ground for hungry monsters of humanity who eat ourselves, who eat our children, who eat our women, who eat our seeds, who eat our forests and our animals, who eat our air and eat 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 and eat. When will we have enough? When is enough enough? Let us begin to know, to deeply know that women indeed make this world go round. That this 365 days of revolution around the sun is a revolution brewing in the witch's cauldron because the times of stakes and burnings have indeed passed. I am the daughter of a mother who is the daughter of a woman. You are the child of a mother who is the child of a woman. And we women, we women cannot live without our lives. Thank you. Come on. Hello. Good afternoon, good evening. Good evening. Peace, y'all. It's good to see you. Always good to see you. I want to welcome everybody to Moad Online. And this is our inaugural installation of Blatant, an installation that focuses on art, joy, and rage, and centers the stories of Black women, Black creative producers, Black mamas, Black artists, yes, all those things, uh, you know, across discipline and across geography. I'm your host, Ashara Ekundayo. I'm glad to be joining you today. And, and I want to let everyone know that this series is going to happen every month, every third Tuesday of the month. It's going to start at 4 p.m. Pacific time. And depending on who I'm speaking to uh, every month, We'll see what the other time zones are. But it's presented by the Museum of the African Diaspora. I'm so honored uh, to be a curator who's working in collaboration with various institutions. And the Museum of the African Diaspora invited uh, this conversation to continue. And it's presented as part of my artist as first responder platform. And so here we are with um, our first conversation in this particular container. And it's my honor to welcome my sisters, Nona Faustine and Shaniqua Gay. Thank you. It's good Hi, to see everybody. you. Yeah. So, you know, we want to start um, our time together, this hour that we have together with a land acknowledgement. It would be um, inappropriate to not center ourselves on this earth uh, and in, this places, in these places where we are together and how we are together and where we make art, where we sleep, where we birth babies. And I am living on uh, the land in Northern California that is the unceded territory of the Ranso Maloney people, of the nation of the Ohlone people. And this place is called Oakland, California. Now, we talk about uh, what it means to have a conversation on what unceded is. And unceded means that 
the Ohlone Nation never did, has not gifted or sold this land to the U.S. government. It means that it is stolen land, it is occupied land, and we want to call in the, the ancestors and the people who have stewarded this place, continue to steward this place, and allow us to walk upon it with some uh, grace, with some forgiveness, uh, with big sticks and light feet, and to, to know and honor that this land is loved and that the First Nation people are still here stewarding this land, and we are in debt uh, in gratitude for that. So with that said, I think we'll introduce each other. Um, we had this invitation. I sent out an invitation for the three of us to think about ways to talk about, you know, briefly a little bit uh, about who we were. And when I asked them to send me conversation on them as siblings, I got back a totally different response than I thought that I was going to get back. It, just, it, it brought me so much joy. <laughs> I was like, so I, you know, I live in the, I live in the Bay Area and we have conversations that are about um, decentralizing power and uh, releasing our shackles of the gender binary. And so I try to practice speaking in non-gendered speech around identity. And so I said, oh, how do you want to introduce your sibling? And what was great is that you all sent me actually information about your sibling. And I said, so that's going to be, <laughs> I said, so that's, that's what's going on. I said, oh, you want to know about my sibling? Oh, that's great because that's part of my life. And the fact that I have work that I make, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who wants to go first? <laughs> oh, that's so great. Um, Nona, do you, Nona, do you want to go? Okay. Sure, I'll introduce you. Okay. So, Shaniqua uh, is, um, I'm not going to read your siblings, <laughs> but you go by gender pronoun of I. Shaniqua is from Atlanta, born and raised off Stewart Avenue. Mm -hmm. And she has been living uh, during the shelter in place at home. Um, and the meaning, let's see, of her name is God is gracious. Uh, it is spiritual connection, anointed scripture, Colossian 1.6, uh, the same God, good news that came to you is going out all over the world and changing lives everywhere. Wow. That's, that's hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are we going to speak to the land? Are we going to speak to the we can. land? We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We're going to get to that in a minute. Let me, in, let me introduce Nona, you know, while we're here. Uh, Nona Faustine. Nona meaning number nine in Latin. Her pronouns are she and her, born in Brooklyn, New York, also known as Lena Poking. Well, I'm not sure how to say Lena P. Hoking. Lena P. Hoking. So we're going to talk about that. Lena P. India. Mm -hmm. She's been sheltering in place there and has one sibling who lives in Brooklyn as well. Uh, she is the mother of Queen Ming. I had the, the gift and the honor of, of being able to, to visit with Nona when you were here. Uh, last year as a visiting artist and lecturer and presenter uh, with professor and badass artist Kenyatta A.C. Hankel uh, at well, the yeah, Berkeley Berkeley. Museum. Yes, at the Brooklyn, the Brooklyn, wow, yeah. at the Berkeley, at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, that's right, at the Berkeley Museum connected to the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and it was just a, a stunning time. And so I'm so happy to have you here, uh, upright breathing in the space. <laughs> we won't talk about that. Yeah. All right, I get to go. Yeah. Introduce the amazing, beautiful Shara Akundayo. Shara means 10 in Arabic and also translate as exalted teacher in the Kabbalah tradition. Ashara uses the pronoun she, them, and Jedi. Come on, somebody. Hey. Born in Detroit, Michigan during the 1967-68 uprising for civil rights. 
She's been sheltering in place in her home of Oakland, California. She has five siblings living between LA, Washington, D.C., and Denver. What's up, y'all? What up, though? What up, though, as we say? Okay. Yeah, so I want to invite folks who are just joining us and, and, and watching online on the Zoom call to uh, put their questions into the chat, like just straight up into the chat. I see some shout outs coming from San Francisco, Florida, uh, Union City, California. So yeah, coast to coast, people are listening in. And you know, what does it mean to like live in these blatant times uh, before, before the video, before we hit, you know, broadcast on the video, we were just talking about the need to allow ourselves and invite grace into our lives, you know, to invite patience and forgiveness into our lives. Because, uh, you know, what's happening right now is really hard and what we're seeing is really blatant. So, you know, when I'm talking about, you know, what it means to be in these bodies, having this experience and what it means for me to be um, authoring this platform around artists as first responder, I talk about it as an embodied designation, uh, a destination, an interactive platform, and a series of discussions and publications that highlight the work of local, national, and international artists whose creative processes heal communities and save lives. You are two of the artists who I have designated as first responders. And so this conversation called Blatant uh, that we're authoring today and co-authoring today is a forum and zine series that centers the lived experiences and the radical imagination of Black women of Black women who are cultural workers and creating across discipline and geography, as we mentioned, across the African diaspora. And so I want to uh, invite you all to share with us and with me again, your art practice and how we've come to be here. But I want to start with getting your thoughts around the poem that we opened up with. Um, the powerful poem and, you know, I'll drop it into the, the uh, chat for those of you who, who didn't get to see it or who would like to watch it again. You know, Nona, tell me, tell me how it made you feel, you know, the blatantness of the invitation. You know, for, you know, it, it hits right at home for me because, you know, one, you know, I am a feminist, um, then came out the room of fe feminist. And, um, you know, but I've been thinking a lot about the lives of women. Um, you know, it certainly centers in my work and in my practice. Um, even today, you know, just hearing about, uh, you know, Congressman Ted Yohu, you know, calling uh, Congresswoman uh, Alexandra uh, Cortez, Ocasio Cortez, a bitch to her face in the halls of Congress, just okay. really set me off. And I mm. looked up his number and left several messages on his voicemail. You know, and it, it, it just goes back to the work that women are doing. And, and then this federal judge that, that was targeted by this anti-feminist, you know, came to her door and took the life of her son and her husband, and just seeing women out there selflessly holding this society together, you know, fighting for men, fighting for their children, fighting for themselves, giving everything they got, you know, and, you know, just how we are the key to holding up this world. We give the life, we nurture the life, we take care of the life, and so, you know, it's just like, hey, I, I know that, you know, and, but, you know, I just wonder when is the world going to really, you know, understand that, understand what she was just talking about, hold yes, us that's up right. as sacred, each one of us are sacred, you know? Hmm. Yes. It really, it, it just, uh, every day is a fight as a, as a woman, you know, as a black woman and you're, 
you know, you're out there, you know, just holding your family together, you know, holding your job together, whatever that may be, yes. which is also holding the economy together. You know, you do, you're doing, you do a multiple, multiple things, you know, that is key to the existence of this earth and its people, you know? Mm hmm Yes, I do know. I know I feel it. I'm inside of it as well. And, you know, having a lot of different kinds of experiences with Black women right now. And uh, Shaniqua, tell me how it landed for you. How do you feel? Um, I'll piggyback on the sacred. Um, I know no one more sacred than Black women. Um, as the progenitors of the nation of humans that walk this earth. Um, and so I deem it um, necessary to build not only myself up, but my mother and my sisters um, in the language of sacred, in the language of ritual, um, in the language of we are beautiful, we are grand, we are first. Yes. Um, and so when she was speaking about eating, 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 um, who, um, who has not suckled from the breast of Black women? Um, and be that with... <laughs> Y'all, I'm saying. Who have we not nourished, right? Um, who have we not made sure that they were okay before ourselves? Mm. Um, I look at the sacrifices that uh, those that came before me make. I look at the sacrifices that Black women make now. And I look at the sacrifices that we prepare ourselves for in the future. And so it hit home. Um, you know, I subscribe to Africana Womanist Theory um, and Black, Black woman struggles. Um, you know, for me, I am Black before I am female. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I am addressed in that way. <laughs> That's right. And so I, I, I it, res it resonated powerfully with me. Um, mm -hmm. Said all that to say. All that, all that to say. <laughs> I, yes, thank you. Thank you for that reflection. I was uh, gifted. I was gifted that poem over the weekend, I'm um, a person who has the honor of being able to participate in one of the collectives, the many collectives uh, that are, you know, feeding us right now. You know, where would we be without our artists creating space and ceremony for us to be together? But the, the space is called the Church of Black Feminist Thought. And yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, it is uh, co-convened by two brilliant PhD students, um, Miyuki Baker and Ra Malika Imhotep. And from time to time for, you know, two years, it was a monthly series, but it happens online now. And you can look up Church of Black Feminist Thought online and find their website. But part of our conversation was over this past Sunday uh, was a Black women's chorus, a choral response, a breathing um, invocation that, you know, fueled by the work of Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, um, for us to like speak into and breathe into the truth of how Black women take care of everyone, as you say, before we take care of ourselves uh, many times. And that expectation being part of, you know, having this embodied experience and coming into this lifetime in a Black body. Mm -hmm. Um, and in a body that is identified as a woman. And so, you know, these conversations I'm hoping will um, pull the thread on what it means to like be inside your creative self as a woman for women of all genders, right. you know, and um, what it means to be inside your blackness and that to be unequivocal. Not, it's not about being apologetic or unapologetic, but it's about, you know, the reality uh, of that space. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, being seen, you know, being centered uh, and being self 
selfless. I don't even want to say selfless, but selfish about it. Being able to love upon ourselves um, in the most blatant ways and, and how that might show up. So your art practices, which are both big and bold and blatant. Uh, I want to start uh, with Nona and if you could walk us through a, a little bit of the timeline uh, of your art practice of photography, how that came to, to be. And I was remembering, you know, where you were this time last year, you know, to talk about uh, that as we, let's just talk about that. Tell me, tell, tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, where we are in this timeline of your career, your creative career. At this time in my creative career, I've produced about three series, I would say, um, mm -hmm. focusing on, on um, self-portraiture, white shoes series, uh, which is ongoing. Uh, I will pick it up in a couple of days, I'm waiting for some of the heat to dissipate. Um, and mitochondrial, which was the first series of um, of my family, three generations of women living in one household, um, my mother, my daughter, and myself, um, and now my sister, Shannon. And um, it's uh, also the other series, My Country, which is about mm -hmm. the monuments in the land that we, the iconic American monuments, if you mm -hmm. will. Um, mm -hmm. I started that. 2016. And so, um, you know, this, this body of work um, that I've produced, uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm really astounded by it all. But um, so that's where we are. And I'm also working on a new series um, about deities mm. and um, um, women as, as sacredness um, and divination. And, um, so it's, it's a lot, it's a lot going on. And I've, I've just had this really big, um, you know, chance to kind of reflect over the past year because I've been doing a lot of traveling. I spent a month in Senegal um, mm -hmm. at Black Rock uh, with Kahende Wally's residency in Senegal, Africa. And that was my first time really being absorbed in Africa. I took a trip in October. October to Egypt, yes. you know, by myself, which was yeah. huge for me, uh, was always a dream of mine, um, and, you know, producing all this work, traveling to different universities, um, talking about my work, um, and so it's just, it's been the past seven years since I've graduated from uh, uh, the master's program at ICC, it's just been like, you know, and then, you know, three books, uh, but actually about five, but three books in the fall are coming out with my work. Um, and I'm just so grateful. I'm, I never expected to really um, be, be heard in this kind of way. You know, mm -hmm. when I, the work I think that I created, it's, you know, one was in tribute to, to New York City, to, to enslaved people who built this city, who was forgotten. But I think at the center, you know, it was autobiographical. It's it about it was about me. It was about a, you know, a woman, a black plus size woman, you know, mother who who of a certain kind of look who is ignored in society, you know, mm -hmm. and um, but also it was celebrating the black body within photography, within um, you know. It, within this culture, this society, you know, is putting me, uh, me or her up on a pedestal and, you know, yes. they look at this person who has given so much, who's descended from these people who've given so much, you know, and so it was a, it was a lot being said. It was a lot being said in, in the work. Um, definitely also about, you know, representation and and monuments and just the history of a city that is in denial, who was in mm -hmm. denial. And at this time, Obama was in office and, and just all of, you know, the hopes and dreams that we had with the Black president and what happened. But um, 
Yeah, you know, it's just, it's so much. And I, I tried to put it all in the work. And even so much is there that I can't even express upon in, in, in this short time. Um, mm -hmm. But the work is, you know, always about, you know, you know, history and how it impacts our lives and um, also the hidden, the hidden meaning in, in the everyday things we look at and celebrate. And, um, you know, so it's, 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 uh, it's so much. Um, I almost get over, uh, sometimes I get overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed um, by it all. Um, but photography is, is the thing that has always been part of my life, has always been there. And it's the tool that, that I use to, to express those thoughts, those feelings, those desires. Um, I think it's a medium that is very well suited to that. It's challenging at times, certainly with the all that I'm thinking and wanting to share. But, you know, when, when you make that image and you know that that's the one, mm -hmm. like, it's like magic. And, and every time, and I think that's what keeps me going. Um, and certainly, um, we're looking at some images right now. Right. Um, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to pause when we, there's, mm -hmm. um, the, we started the series um, with some, yes, you bare-breasted, you naked, um, blatant out there for all to behold, lay bare, as we say, to stand naked before ourselves and each other and community. Uh, and, you know, there's conversation happening in the uprisings around the world and the history the history of Black women bearing our breasts and showing up naked in protest, in lament, in rage. Um, and I, I want to know, it, you know, what the underpinnings are of your display, you know, your offering to us, because we are blown away by your work. I'm, I'm looking at some of the comments in the chat, uh, that, that, you know, to just, let's, let's talk about, you know, you being a dark skin black woman who has, uh, as you said, plus size, you know, your description of plus size and just being like, this is what it is. Yeah, you know, um, I w the beginning of the work started in 2012. The first image I created was a studio shot of me indoors mm -hmm. um, with white gloves, a tiara and white shoes sitting on a stool of royal blue fabric. And at the time, I was in a grad school program that was very intense. Um, it was lots of, you know, reading and writing. It was actually a beautiful program. But I was in the institution. I was in mm -hmm. an institution that did not see me, that did not really see my work and the work that I was creating. And the people also, some of the people around me. And I think... Uh, Looking back, what out there with my clothes on, uh, on a play oh, all those at the same time, I'm in a uh, master's program that did not focus on the work of people of color. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what that did also uh, denying the things that I was interested in, I wanted to say in my work. Um, and then, you know, saying that I devalued someone's degree by being in the bro program. You know, when I'm one of two black women in the program and you're gonna say mm -hmm. that I devalued so, you know, it was yes. an action to being in the institution and, but also, uh, you know, just, I was, I was, the things that, were going on around me at the time. I'm seeing all these being really publicized on social media. Mm -hmm. And I was I was angry. I was I was angry. I was very angry. But there was a part of me that was celebrating, you know, the black female form, my black female form. And so, you know, I knew, you know, it's one thing also to talk about those sites and talk about that history. But how are you going to get people to understand the weight, the gravity of what you are talking about? 
-hmm. you know, and the center of black men, you know, we don't talk about black women in slavery. I mean, now we do, yeah. But yes. really, at the, even, even in certain, it's just, it's, it's in certain ways. So, um, black, the black female, you know, I'm not playing a slave. Um, I am myself, hmm. but I have okay. a lineage of history. So that's, that's, right. that's what, how that, that we got to that point. <laughs> got it. Oh, oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the beautiful description of that as well and the thickness of it. Some of the images, if we go forward a few more, um, are around monuments, you know, the discussion again around monument, yes. And then there's a line in between them, a bloodline, uh, sometime a bloodline or a black line. Um, you know, before, you know, we, we move to the next part of the conversation, can you talk a little bit about the, the blurring out that you do, that, you know, what that process is and why you do that? It's, a, it's you know, using my, it's a conceptual abstract tool that I'm using when I'm creating these images for my country. Um, so the, the, the red lines are usually for contested monuments. And this is the monument from the museum history, um, which is a president of Roosevelt with a, a black man beneath him on one side and a Native American on the other, which you can't see in the image. And so, uh, you know, activists have been, and scholars have been talk, you know, targeting this statue, talking about That's right. the things within a statue. So the red is for contested when you often see that. And the black line is for the hidden history, usually African American history or American history. Um, uh, so that, you know, is in that, but uh, I think, it also, you know, you make the, the work in one vein, and then a lot of times it takes on this new meaning. There's Christopher Columbus at 59th Street, um, certainly contests the statue. Um, but I think there's there's also a lot of hidden hidden and dual meanings and multiple meanings in these uh, these lines, you know, and in yes. a lot of interpretation, you know, um, and I'm open to that, but that's that's the basis of of creating the work, and that's a statue. Let me. This is actually the first image that uh, led me to create the body of work of my country, um, mm -hmm. taken from the Staten Island Ferry um, in 2016, April of 2016, before um, the big election. And to me, it was some kind of like warning in the uh, that you know it was going to be chaos, you know, that liberties and freedoms were going to be impacted, um, that that was one of the signs when I created this, um, kind of almost by accident. Um, by accident. Let's, um, but thank you. nothing is really ever really accidental in art, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then right. I went to, to uh, Washington in October of 2016 while President Obama was in office to get a snapshot of the country before it all changed. There was this looming purple gray, you know, um, clouds everywhere. The, sun, the, the sky was bright, but then there was these clouds on the horizon. And I was like, oh, you know, so it was, it was incredible. Thank you. Who, um, Shaniqua Gay, uh, whom I met on Instagram. <laughs> yes, who I met on Instagram and who I had the, the gift of being able to show your work uh, at my gallery in downtown Oakland uh, in 2019. Uh, I want to talk about, you know, creating and art making during this worldwide cataclysmic uprising. That's, that's where we are and, and your work and um, the masking and unmasking and grandness of it and how you use space and take over space, reclaim space. And again, this, uh, these blatant invitations that Black women have made are birthing, are offering, are conjuring this circle that we cast uh, over and over and over. Um, 
you know, can you share? I don't know if you want to share your screen or if you want. I cannot share my screen, Elizabeth. Okay, so, so, so Elizabeth, if you could, if you could, um, Elizabeth is our is the uh, director of public programs at the Museum of the African Diaspora and is running tech for us this afternoon. So thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate you. you. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want us to show the video first? And is um, this the video? Well, it depends on what you want to start with. So this is uh, the Hammonds House Museum, um, where I did a body of work called Lit Without Sherman, a love letter to the West End. Mm -hmm. West End, uh, like across this nation, is an all-Black community that is being um, disturbed by gentrification. And so um, I think it's important that we are the authors of our narratives, that we are able to tell counter narratives to what the dominant culture tells. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, I felt like it was important to posit the histories of this area and for the, the people who actually live there to have autonomy. Um, and so it wasn't a thought process of I speak for us, um, but that I canvassed the neighborhood, spoke to the people. This is also a, a kind of a place I grew up grew up in. Uh, over in Atlanta, my, gran my grandmother literally stayed uh, like five minutes up the street from this museum. Okay. So it was not an unfamiliar space. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are a couple of things happening there, right? So um, I am knowledgeable of the space. I'm uh, one who has lived in the community mm -hmm. and, um, you know, representations of how this community is, is changing and turning. Yeah. So, let's, uh, so uh, let's, let's show the video. Okay. Oh, oh we have the dogs. <laughs> sorry. So I, I actually don't think I can show the video. I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. Um, there are photos. If let's you want. yeah. Let's just yeah. Let's go into the photos. I think those are pretty great representations of what's happening there. Uh, this room is the HBC you HBC room. Um, uh, the West End houses the HBCUs in that community, which is Clark Atlanta University, uh, Morris Brown, Spelman, and Morehouse. Um, one of the things a lot of people don't know, W.E.B. Du Bois um, actually um, was housed there. He wrote The Souls of Black Folks there, um, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's a, it's a historical space. And I felt like he was the drum major and kind of uh, pushing us forward in how people view ourselves. So I framed him, reframing uh, that narrative and um, similar to what you were talking about, uh, taking up space. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I, I am definitely one of those who like to uh, have people immersed in all the blackness I can possibly muster. Okay. Um, and so this is a, a little different from, you know, um, my, my other bodies of work, which focuses on hybridity, but um, design and motif is also very important um, in my body of work. And so site-specific work. Mm -hmm. uh, zone specific works are, are important um, and I have various ways to speak to that. Let's go to the next one. Oh, I see. So um, your uh, work, your, this, this body of work is actually installed on the wall. Um, it, yeah, is so it, it, com is it a painted. combination of, yeah, I was going to ask, is it a combination yeah. of paintings and stencils? Yeah, it's and painted. It's um, painted on the wall. Uh, it took me 21 days to install it in the house. All right, um, 21 days for installation. Um, and so it um, contained paintings on the wall. It also contained a, a video uh, piece where um, I have uh, people in the community coming out of Twal schema mm -hmm. uh, and speaking about what the West End community means to them. Um, so it's, it's several. I did, I used acrylic, I used a decal, I used video. And I did an oil painting as well upstairs. They're quite beautiful. Thank um, you. I remember um, the first time I saw your work, uh, you know, somehow, it, you know, I think who introduced me to your work or sent me your Instagram was uh, curator uh, Janelle <laughs> sent it to me. Janelle sent it to me and, wow. <laughs> and her work. She and I met um, in Santa Cruz a few years ago at museum camp, actually. And so we have stayed in touch and she's uh, 
a really important um, and, and poignant advocate for artists and uh, her centering and her respect of Black women and our practices and the way in which, you know, what is unique about how we show up. Right. Let's keep, let's, let's move through a couple. I'm wondering if we're going to, oh, tell me about this piece. Um, so this is the West End Saints. There are several mm -hmm. clinical figures uh, in the West End. Um, uh, I wanted to speak to those figures. And so I turned them into saints, kind of this old world view of um, mm -hmm. deifying um, people into, the, into sainthood. <laughs> yes. And so I took uh, the Clegg. This is Albert Clegg and his daughter, Pearl Clegg. Um, uh, the West End houses, um, I'm sure you're familiar in Detroit, um, what is called uh, the Shrine of the Black Madonna. We That's have right. here in Atlanta, yep. which is over in the West End. And um, yep. uh, Brother Clegg is a founder of um, the Shrine of the Black Madonna. His daughter is an amazing author and writer about the West End. I felt like it was important for her to be represented um, as a saint. Mm -hmm. um, also, H. Rap Brown. Um, mm -hmm was also um, placed um, over in the West End. He was very pinnacle and key in cleaning up that neighborhood and therefore targeted because he was so key <laughs> in cleaning up this area. Um, can, can we talk a little bit about the land, you know, um, you know, the conversation around land acknowledgement, the West End, Georgia, uh, Atlanta and Georgia in particular. When I asked you about a land acknowledgement and when I asked you about land acknowledgement and how that conversation might show up in this discussion um, there's an importance around space you know that you're talking about and taking up space and the people on the land mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about Georgia there's there was there was part of our conversation around how it used to all be one well it state. used to be Mississippi you know and I think it all used to just be Mississippi <laughs> Um, and so during the, you know, the, the Confederacy, um, there was a lot of breaking up of spaces. And then um, when you're talking about um, placing indigenous people um, onto the Trail of Tears, um, a lot of things were broken up uh, during that treaty, I believe, which was in 1800s. Um, yeah, just breaking up, uh, breaking up that land into, mm. into different areas. And so uh, the Muskegee and the Creek Nations um, yeah, took yeah. up what we know to be Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and South Carolina. That's how okay. they, they spread across. Um, and I, I'll, I'll honor my great great grandmother Savannah, who was a Creek um, Creek Indian. Um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of us are more Native American than we are quote unquote African. <laughs> a lot of us have um, uh, roots here. And it's not just us saying I got Indian in my family because of the hair, right? Um, uh, all of it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's an, y'all want to go? We're not going there. No, we don't have to go there. But just to, we don't have to go there today. <laughs> but yeah, just, but, yeah. Just, to, just to speak, speak, speak to yeah. that. Um, yeah, we, we have that in there. That, I know that. Um, a lot of our ancestors integrated themselves into slavery to survive. Um, mm -hmm. We don't talk about that as, uh, enough um, as we should. Are, are some of those stories that are inside of your murals and inside of your paintings? I see the, the pieces we're looking at right now are these sculptures in the middle of the room and your headdresses um, that are often anapomorphic as well. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the pieces that are on the wall versus the pieces that are in the room and your performances that are also part of um, your practice. The goal is to take up space. The goal yeah. is to make black women larger than life, 20 feet mm. tall, um, mm. at all possible for you to be immersed um, in an environment um, that speaks to the spirit of black womanhood. Um, and so we're not from unfamiliar, right, with this kind of taking up animal spirits uh, mm. to speak to the power of who we are. And well, well, whether that is familiar in Native American tribes, African tribes, or sports teams, right? The Bulls, <laughs> the Ravens, the Hawks. Um, at, for whatever reason, we try to separate its translation. Um, but for me, it is housing that spirit um, of, of 
the bull, of the deer, of the raven, of the vulture, the way um, vulture uh, clean up, they, uh, hmm. they pick up the carry-on, the way black mm -hmm. women clean, we the clean out woman. Oh, yeah, <laughs> doing that day work. Doing the dead work. Doing, doing that, day. that day work, yeah, doing that work of the mule as right. well. Those, right. those. Right. right, and so I, I think it was, I felt like it was really important to, um, yeah, speak to our power in an uh, unconventional way or yeah. in a traditional way or in a way that is sacred, in a way that um, speaks the ritual. And so um, hybridity is a continued language throughout my body of work probably for the past seven, eight years, something like that. Uh, I've been focused toward hybridity, um, but um, up until the past four or five years, I've been focused on hybridity and um, black womanhood. And all of that was kind of started from a conversation between Gloria Steinem and Bell Hooks. Mm -hmm. speak so often, Bell Hooks has this um, dope new school series lecture. Uh, I've been watching. It, I've been it, mm -hmm. it is something to watch. Um, I love I love Bell Hooks, and um, but I really love the conversation that she and Gloria Steinem had, um, where. Uh, she spoke about over the course of 3,000 years, um, Egypt began to remove divinity away from women and nature. And Gloria Hook spoke about how can Black people ever truly decolonize our minds if we cannot imagine God as ourselves. And so for mm -hmm. me, a light bulb went off because uh, mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, we are God. And I don't know nobody more godly than Black women. And so um, I just kind of set out on this path to to speak to the ways that we are divine in nature um, that, uh, you know, I, I'm very quick to posit that, you know, for those of you who follow a biblical notion or even from the Quran, mm -hmm. I believe that it is let us and not um, let me, <laughs> let us, yes. them and our image. And so for me, I believe black women are the them um, and I'm, I'm pro creating um, my own myths, new narratives, restructuring, you know, yes. about recreating, yes. uh, denying old parentage, denying old roots, denying what, what has been placed upon me and creating my own. Uh, so I'm not looking to go beyond a myth. I'm looking to stay right, right where I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ashe. Ashe, as the church says. <laughs> um, I love that you mentioned the Shrine of the Black Madonna. So born and raised in Detroit and okay. we lived... I lived three blocks from the shrine of the Black Madonna. Okay. So um, when I go home from time to time, it's only open like on the weekend now. And who knows when it's open, if it's open at all during this pandemic. But uh, the impact of um, blatant Blackness and knowing yourself as the divine and God as Black and the, the Madonna as Black. The Madonna and, is Black. The Madonna, the Madonna as black and beautiful, the mother of all things. And, you know, in different traditions, the Madonna being Yemaya, the, the traditions that say the birthing of all things come from um, blackness, that right. all, all beings, all things on this planet are created in the blackness, in the soil, in the darkness, in the completeness of, of women's wombs, um, in the completeness of the womb of the planet. This piece right here. This, this touching of the heart. Tell me about these. We've been looking at some paintings and photographs and prints, but this piece wait, is wait, wait. So before, you move, before we move, um, just okay. my the Shrine of the Black Madonna. I remember being mm -hmm. floored um, as a young person going to the Shrine of the Black Madonna in the West End. They have this huge image of a Black Madonna. Um, as soon as you walk in, yeah, to this, in the, to this church, there's this huge image, and it is it's flooring if you grew up the way that I did, right? So I grew up with ministers, evangelists, my parents are pastors, and mm. you know, continuously going to black churches and never seeing representations of yourself, right? And so when you think about how your life has been curated, curated to only see Christ that looks like this blonde hippie white Jesus, and then you go to the shrine of the black Madonna and they say, no, it's this, right? Mm -hmm. Or, and then you begin to research and you see that the Pope himself bows to a black Madonna. That's right. That's right? right. So then you become like, well, wait, somebody lying, first of all. Somebody lying. Somebody somewhere is lying. Um, and then to feel empowered. Mm -hmm. And how important images are 
um, in the language of who we are, right? So, uh, right, this constant imagery uh, of empowerment that you see um, that I felt like I got from hip hop culture, old hip hop, not what Come on. current. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, not to deny, not to deny, but I understood. I got a, a you know a huge understanding about who I am as a black woman through hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I just didn't want to move from that. But speaking to this image, this is acceptance. Um, I think there is nothing more endearing than the narrative between a black mother and her daughter. Uh, this is actually a mother and daughter. And I feel like you can see that just by the way they look at each other. Um, it, is not, it is not performative. I didn't make them do what they're doing. Um, it was just, it was, it was a beautiful capture. I can't, um, you know, take credit or, you know, positioning them or anything like that. Right. I just felt like it was beautiful um, representation of strength, of delicacy, uh, you know, of, of being delicate. Tenderness. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Again, of true love. Um, you just see it. You see it. Um, and I didn't have to work to get this in. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. I know that love. <laughs> You know, um, I know the love of being, you know, you know the is, love of being a mother and of being touched and having the right. opportunity to touch my mother, uh, to touch her heart. Thank you for, for that. I know we have um, some more images. Maybe we'll get back to that. I want to, I want to talk about um, blatant rage. You know, I want to talk about being an angry black woman, you know, and owning that. Um, and how that shows up in our in our creative practices and how it shows up in our lives and i've been i've been really hella angry you know hella black feminist hella angry during the this co this coronavirus and covid 19 pandemic and uh you know nona you know i want to i want to talk with you about being someone who had to grapple with that the the virus in your body and the as you say, you, your sister, your mother, and your daughter all being in the same household, and me watching you really broadcast uh, the, the reality of COVID-19 in New York, uh, in your body, yeah. you know, and, and what that meant for you to be like on Facebook every day, you know, some days you were lying down and could hardly speak, and we were like, I'm like, what's this artist? I'm like, come on. I'm mad. I'm really mad about it, and I'm mad about well, tell us, you know, I'm about still, your experience. Still, I still can't, you know, I'm angry. I'm, you know, afraid. I'd be lying if I, I say I wasn't afraid. Um, but yeah, I caught COVID in late March. Um, you know, we, we, we figured it out that we probably got it going to the supermarket before New York City shut down. Mm. City, we did a run to the supermarket to stock up. And my sister was the one who came down with symptoms first and it was so mild I didn't I was like it's just a cold uh, but it, she she kind of knew she was you know doing her research and then of course we all fought it and um you know my reaction was to let someone know you know that if, if something happened to me this is what happened because at the time they weren't letting you know people come to the hospital unless you were dying and um, I was like, what if we die here, you know? And so I would just, mm -hmm. I started recording, you know, from my bed, um, giving people updates, letting them know what the symptoms are, how I was feeling. And, you know, um, yeah, some days I could not, uh, you know, it got really, really bad. Um, but, you know, we as a household were taking care of each other. You know, my sister, was taking care of me as she got better quicker and you know before all of us and so you know she was there you know doing almost saintly godly work you know saving her sister and her mother you know nursing us looking mm -hmm. up recipes um and everything and I just wanted to let the world know you know this is this is real and should I die you know what happened to me um, because I had had a, my, my dear friend, Maurice Berger, the critic, writer, yes. died of a heart attack, and he was not listed as having COVID because he died of a heart attack, but it was, he, he had COVID, 
And so, mm-hmm. you know, he's not on that official list. And mm-hmm. I was like, and once that happened, you know, I just was like, you know, that was my reaction also to, to Maurice passing and letting someone know, you know, that what's going on. So that was, that was my, my story. And, you know, then all these other stories started to come out. So I think I want to all know it's, it's okay to, it, it, it's okay to share and let people know what is going on with you. And then us as a diaspora, you know, I knew that mm-hmm. the stories of Black people were not going to be publicized. What this was doing to That's our right. communities were That's not right. going to be publicized. And even though I'm an artist and I'm kind of got some notoriety, still, I wanted to see who's going who's gonna to know about me. Who's going to know my, about my little Black family here in Brooklyn, you know, in our pre-war apartment, you know what I'm saying, in my, in my, in my neighborhood of, of, you know, Caribbean and African-American people, you know, and this building that I live in is mostly Caribbean and, you know, they were suffering too. And my neighbors underneath me, uh, a family like my whole life, except for the husband and the, and the daughter. And so I was just, yeah, that was my reaction. To wow. That. Yeah. I remember the day you posted that your neighbors underneath you had died. Yeah. Um, I remember I just being, it just being sad. Um, and, and I want to note that your daughter did not contract. Uh, we, she didn't, she, we you, get it, so we, oh, you couldn't get a test. Any symptoms. She wasn't showing it other than she had, um, a, a, she couldn't taste. So uh, that is a little symptom, symptom of COVID, you know, so. Yes. But other, she's fine. She's yeah. fine. Yeah. Thank God. Um, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, there are also people, you know, in the chat are, you know, thanking, thanking us for the transparency of this kind of conversation. And again, this is about being counted, being seen, knowing our stories. You know, if something happens to me, this is what happens. And, exactly. you know, the, the, the invitation that, that Black people uh, have needed to start saying, if I get pulled over, if I get arrested, if I die, note that this is what happened, right. not this other crazy narrative that might show up. And you know, you're speaking to something that's, that's really poignant for me is that the stories of black people, whether they be the stories of catastrophe or the stories of celebration are not being shown um, by mainstream media that we actually have to continue to design our narratives, to create our own media and to deploy that information to each other in in a a myriad of ways, this being one of them. Um, You know, Shaniqua, you know, Georgia, the the craziness of COVID-19 and Georgia. (laughs) And, you know, like I said, being an angry black woman, um, you know, can you chop it, chop it up for us? You know, what your experience has been? Because I also want to hear if if either of you um, have like engaged in an art practice that is fueled by COVID-19. But what, what's going on um, um, with the conversations with your community and Black folks? You know? Yeah, uh, the craziness that is happening here in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I'm angry that uh, somehow a racist ass disease and virus has been created that greatly impacts our people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Right, those of us who are easily um, or who suffer from pre-existing conditions, even those who do not, um, asymptomatic, um, I'm highly upset. Uh, my family has definitely been impacted. We, um, you know, last week had a death in our family of my 93-year-old bonus grandmother uh, con- uh, contracted COVID and has mm-hmm. passed away um, while she is the first quote-unquote death in our family. She is not our per- the first one to be impacted by it. Um, I have family members who are essential workers who have contracted it, uh, who have had to go to the hospital to be um, laid wait, who have been put out the hospital. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Try not to cry. Um, it, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts that we have a governor who has sued our mayor for trying to protect us because we are pretty much an all black city here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, um, 
it hurts. It hurts. Uh, yes, I have created work um, uh, for COVID, not necessarily mask wearing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, bodies of work or just speaking to this, this space that I'm in. I have an installation at a restaurant here in Atlanta that wanted to do immersive art experience as well as encourage um, social distancing. I have like masks. So what, yeah, so what does that mean? Immersive and right, right. social distancing? There are mannequins all over the space that have these masks that I create. I created 25 masks along with some assistance in about a week um, uh, in order for people to sit at separate tables. This encourages social distancing. It's actually something um, that they began doing in other countries. Um, but this is something that a United States or Atlanta restaurant took it upon themselves to also duplicate. And so they did so with uh, the masks that I make, uh, placing them on mannequins and um, putting up my photography all over uh, this restaurant um, so that one, it'll bring in, you know, patrons uh, who support the arts, but it also encourages like this kind of- um, Yes. Social, mm -hmm. social distancing, but from a personal perspective um, or just personally working on bodies of work about COVID, I have not, I have not. I'm sure that that will present itself eventually, um, but I'm just not sure in what way. Um, and it may, it doesn't always have to be um, like a, a visual presentation. Um, I'm really a writer who paints so I will more than likely, <laughs> I will I will more than likely be writing about these experiences, journaling about these experiences, and and looking for a way to talk about it um, more so than you know this kind of visual presentation. Uh, the other thing is the civil unrest that has mm -hmm. you know swept this yes. way across this nation. Yes. Um, you know because people need something to do everybody's up in arms about things that have been happening uh, across this nation. Uh, I will say justice for Breonna Taylor. That's right. Um, right now right. and today, I will say justice for Sequoia T Turner, an eight-year-old mm -hmm. girl who was shot and killed here in Atlanta. And I will say uh, justice for Jada Pinkett, free black women's mm -hmm. sexuality. Come on. Um, <laughs> Come on. No. <laughs> This is some real. I, I, I didn't know. I, okay, okay. Like black yes. women, black women. It's like, are we about to like really yes. break this down? Because it's like, if y this whole kind of slut shaming a badass Jada Pinkett, I'm like, you know what? You know what? It. You know, I'm not here for it. You're not gonna do it. You're not gonna do it. You're not gonna do it. <laughs> What you're not going to do is tell a black woman that she can't get it when she wants it, where she wants it, from who she wants it. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No, no, no. And you her know. characterization of what it actually was. Right. It was an entanglement. She said it was an entanglement. I support her. Okay, entangled. <laughs> but, 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 and, and, and yes for the distraction. That's I'm sorry. I'm not trying to get it No, no. No, no, no. It's all part of the same <laughs> cipher. It's all part of the same cipher. I'm just saying okay. the conversation around censoring, acknowledging, celebrating, um, speaking the names of Black women who have been killed by state-sanctioned violence and straight up murdered. And Breonna Taylor is, is one, of our, one of our ancestors. Right. One of our ancestors, one of thousands and thousands and thousands. And, you know, when we speak their names and we remember and when we also... Um, really try to untangle ourselves from kind of the heteronormative, homophobic, transphobic trope that is also part of um, some conversations in Black community. You know what I mean? And so I just, I also want to... And we have to acknowledge all the trans women that That's right. Killed. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's like women of all genders. Trans women, fighting yes. fighting a harder fight than any of us. So yeah, let's, uh, yeah, let's take a breath for that, for that acknowledgement. And we have to arrest, we have to arrest the police that murdered Breonna Taylor in her home. Right. You know, um, that has to be part of our everyday work. Right. And, you know, we'll, we'll put into uh, the chat and into the conversation 
as we'll see on Facebook and, you know, this, this conversation, um, different ways in which creatives, which artists have made work, uh, wrote poems, created chants, done movement work, done energy work, done spiritual work, done religious work, done the hoodoo, voodoo work, just for us to be awakened and alive into to that reality. Um, I know we're going to be coming up on time in a few minutes, so I'm going to do some thank yous, but I, I want us to be thinking about, you know, what it means around designing collective repositories for blatant joy, you know, in our art making and blatant grief as well, and what that means to, to hold space for each other in this grieving uh, and in this rage. Um, you know, how can I say this, how do we increase our capacity to conjure, you know, spaces like that? And, you know, maybe both of you can just briefly speak to, you know, the next step or where you might be going uh, in your art practice as a first responder, because what, what I know is that we going to show up anyway. Sisters going to show up anyway. Black women going to show up anyway. And the artist always shows up first. Even those of us who don't consider ourselves or identify as artists, it is your artistic creative self that is conjuring these, uh, these spells and these uh, healing opportunities. So where, where are you going next, uh, Nona, with this? Well, you know, just, just really quickly, I've always said that artists are the healers. We are the ones out there, you know, analyzing and assessing what is going on in the land and society. And, and so, um, you know, a lot of my art practice is, is also about healing and, and conjuring and, and looking, you know, for those signals in the land. But um, I'm working, you know, on a piece, uh, as I said, of the, called Demeter. And it is about, you know, rearranging the story of, of Demeter, the Greek myth, who, uh, mm -hmm. she, a goddess who loses her daughter and is searching over the land for her daughter. Um, and so um, I, have, I have some pieces out now about that. Um, takes place in Brooklyn you know, in Prospect Park, oh, and right. uh, uh, Greenwood Cemetery. And, you know, I'm also um, working on, um, oh, I lost my train of thought, but yeah, that's, that's one piece and the White Shoe series. I'll be out there in the streets, going to sites um, mm -hmm. that are found in Staten Island and in Queens and in Bronx where our people are hidden, you know, some of them, um, and, and, and in the Bronx. You know, um, so that's, that's still calling out. Yes. Still calling, calling out. out. Still calling, still out. calling out. And taking up space. Yes. In uh, Shaliqua, you have, what is the next step here? Um, I'm going to continue to do the work. I'm going to continue to plow. I'm going to continue to dig up. I'm going mm -hmm. to continue to retell stories and make and create my own narratives. I'm going to continue to be the author of my story. I'm going to continue to heal. I'm going to continue to rest because we ain't always got the work. Um, that's that's right. right. So there, there, there is language. Oh, no, that's right. <laughs> there is language to resting uh, because mm -hmm. we are supposed to be at peace and we are supposed to heal and we have a right to heal um, and we can be our own reparation. Um, and so for me, healing um, and rest and seeing myself as sacred is a form of reparations. Um, continuing to do the work that I, that I do um, and to let other makers and creators who are Black women know that we are free to create. Uh, because I think there is uh, still some, some, some hinging, some boundaries on, on a lot of us, it, you know, it hurts me to my heart that, you know, the women in my family who are makers and creators don't see themselves as that. Um, mm -hmm. Or don't give themselves permission uh, to stick that language. Um, but I have lots of proposals on the table. Who knows if they'll actually go to, go to pass, right? Because the whole city's locking down again. Uh, <laughs> well, but, well. 
but, you know, come on. Um, but I'm gonna I'm continue to speak <laughs> them as though they exist. Um, right? Speak those things that are not as though they are. Um, That's right. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions? Oh. Real quick. You know, there there's so many comments. There's, there's oh. all these beautiful comments. There was one question that came at the beginning, which was actually my last question to you all. So, you know, here it is. Uh, just tell me the last example or the last experience or manifestation you saw of blatant joy. Blatant joy. Last man. So the last thing you saw, it might be online, it could have been on the, I don't know, it, blatant joy. Um, it was my, I have to say it was my daughter, Queen Ming, um, discovering Martin Lawrence show, Martin, and the laughs and giggles <laughs> that just discovering his, his antics and, you know, we, we grew oh, up wow. and, and to right. see, you know, I know Martin, I know his craziness, you know, but to, to see that in a new generation and she just stayed up for hours watching him <laughs> and laughing and just when she laughs, it makes me happy because that means something has given her such pleasure. And I, 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 when, a, when a woman is happy, when a child, a girl child is happy in this world, I don't know. I just love it. It, just, it makes me happy. So that was pure joy. Yeah. Oh, that makes me so happy to hear that. To hear of a little black girl laughing. Yeah. Black woman laughing. You know, hear black women laughing. Hear black girls laughing. Thank you. And all right for, yes, comedy and breath and, and all of that. Shaniqua, what was your last experience? Um, blatant joy. Late and joy for me, um, for those of you who have older children, you know, they get to a point where they ignore you, where you, they, you're not like the, the world that they are surrounded around. So I have a 20 year old and um, I am not his globe. Um, <laughs> but what brought me joy was yesterday morning, he just came into my room he gave me a kiss on the cheek. He sat beside me and hugged me. And he said, I just want you to know I love you. Um, and that I, I'm thinking about you. I just want to come in here and sit up under you. Um, and for a 20-year-old black male who's more concerned with girls and, and rap and social media and all that, that meant everything for me as a mom. Um, that he remembers me. That I'm not too much of an old lady right now. And so that was... Uh -huh. <laughs> that was that was joy. <laughs> oh, I love it. Everything. 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 You know, I know. I know, and plus, I know it's difficult for him right now because he's not on a college campus. He's not in his place of independence. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I know it's hard for him, um, you know, not being amongst his friends. Um, and, you know, we tried to take the social distancing and stay at home, staying at home seriously. Yeah. And so um, it's been kind of difficult for him. Um, but I appreciated his acknowledgement of his old mama. <laughs> you feeling like an old mama these days? <laughs> no. yeah. I old soul. I reference myself that way all the time. Yeah. He hates yeah. me, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm cool with it. Mm -hmm. my, my younger son, who will be 29 this year, my younger son. Are you uh, serious? Do you have a 29-year-old? I, I have a 34-year-old son. What? And uh, about to about to be 29 year old son and three granddaughters. That's another, it's another conversation we can drink. What's the name of the water? What's the name of the water? It ain't the funny. What's water. It's, it's, <laughs> I grew up in the D. It's water. It's just water. It's just water. <laughs> it's like, look, what I'm saying is that he's six, four and he will still, he still needs lap time. You know, just, I'm so, I have, so, I'm so, I so love that they still need lap time. It's like, boy, <laughs> it's like, get off me. But he is like, you know, and, but yeah, so I can appreciate, you know, just the, the feeling of that kind of acknowledgement of like, I see you mom, you know, when you're, when you're, when your children become old enough and mature enough to realize that you're adults together, you know, right. you're adults together and they, you know, but you know, like you still, you're still my kid, but we're adults together. And there's an acknowledgement that we can, 
give to each other around like we going through it we all got something right and we're all going through it so I want to thank you both so much for your time today for for helping us launch helping um, me launch this into this this conversation that I get to have with my sisters, you know, for the next, I don't know, at least six months or so. Um, and I, thank you. Thank you. Um, so here, hold on for a second. I, I want to do some, I just need to do some closing, um, some closing and reminders. So again, you know, yeah, blatant. So this blatant art, blatant joy, blatant rage. This is a series that's going to be, uh, right here on the Museum of the African Diaspora channels, on their Facebook, on their YouTube, uh, and in the Zoom link, you can register every month. It's every third Tuesday, four o'clock Pacific time. Uh, the next installation will be on Tuesday, August 18th, and I will be visiting with my Detroit homegirl, Tiff Massey, as well as my Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania sister love, Alicia B. Wormsley. Um, and, you know, to really to, to invite you all to join us and to continue to join us for that. And I want to, I really want to say thank you to Moat. I really want to um, appreciate them for this space and to, to big up the partners. So, you know, they have online, this, their online game. I don't know about y'all, but I have so been enjoying the superb level of on, online programming that Moat has been offering us. And Art Bridges has been their online programming sponsor. So big ups and, and uh, thanks to them. And then I want to thank my collaborators for Artists as First Responder who are supporting Blatant on this level and at other levels being the Girls and Women of Color Collaborative, the Akinati Foundation, uh, the San Francisco Foundation, the Women's Foundation of California, the Art and Cultural uh, African-American Art and Culture Center in the Fillmore in San Francisco and, and then the recast grant for the city of Oakland. So those are our partners. And, and then finally, I just want to invite you all to support Moab, you know, to show up for them and, and to make a contribution, to make a donation in any kind of way to continue to support this programming, to continue to pull out the voices of the, the creative genius of the African diaspora. Um, and you can, you can go to their website, it's really our website because, you know, I'm in there right now. So it's moadsf.org. You can make a donation also by texting them. You can actually do that right now. You can like pick up your phone and text them. Uh, the text number is 56512. And you just type the word moadsf and then you click the link and you can just donate right now. Um, yeah, so yeah, 56512. 56512 is how you type, you know, a text donation to them. And, and that's our show for the day. You know, that's our, our blatant love. Um, thank you, Nona. Thank you, Shaniqua. Uh, we'll, come back. we'll be following you all on your social media and on your website. Have a beautiful day. Thank you all so much. This was great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, this was great. Thank you, people. Thank you, people. Wow.